Welcome to the Tech Sales Show, dedicated to making you a better seller. Recorded 4,827 miles across the Atlantic Ocean with Bobby Das from Houston, Texas, a father, husband, golfer, pilot, and tech seller. And Brian Evans, an expat in London, England, family man, 2X Ironman, and an ERP salesman. Both sharing tried and true sales strategies and providing free tools to make each week and campaign easier for you. They also answer your questions weekly. Now, here is Bobby and Brian. Hey, hey, Bobby. What's up, Brian? Well, we have another listener's choice. This is all about cognitive bias. Uh, this is a fascinating topic. It's a bit of a, a, a obtuse episode, but it's going to be a lot of fun to work through. Uh, cognitive bias, uh, for those of you not familiar, it's basically a deviation from a normal or rational judgment. So because cognitive bias, it, it's like this, think of it as kind of a built-in mental shortcut process for you. It allows our minds to come to certain conclusions. And because we're all kind of type A alpha people, it helps us influence others to come to the same certain conclusions, it can dictate a behavior that's somewhat irrational. This usually leads to bad judgments or a blind spot that could impact the way we run our sales business. So with all that being said, these aren't all necessarily bad. Some of these biases that we talk about may lead to more effective actions in the right context. Um, These kind of mental shortcuts enable us to make faster decisions when a timeline is more valuable than accuracy. So if you're having to make a, a quick snap decision, leaning on your cognitive bias is kind of a defense mechanism in a lot of ways. And then some of these cognitive biases are a byproduct of human limitations. So there's only so many computations you can do in your side of your head. Uh, so there, there again, not this is not a negative towards cognitive bias. It can be something that could be a reasonable approach to a challenging scenario. So it was a big setup. But that said, today we're going to walk through several examples of uh, cognitive biases, and we're going to talk about how this could have a negative impact on the way you run your tech sales business, whether that's on how you evaluate deals, whether that's how you work with your peers, or run uh, big evaluations for new prospective customers. And as a special bonus, we've got a special guest today with us, Scott Evans, who happens to be Brian's brother. Scott, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? Hey guys, thanks for uh, letting me join the show. So uh, I'll, I'll just start from a personal level. I uh, live in Texas in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. Um, happily married, lucky dad of a couple of kiddos, two girls in fact, and my oldest girl just started kindergarten last week. So I'm just getting started with the, uh, the kiddos front. Um, from a professional standpoint, I started my career in the services world working for a systems integrator um, as a project manager. So um, have experience doing a lot of development projects and infrastructure type projects. Uh, spent a few years there and then moved to Microsoft and have been in various roles through with, with Microsoft throughout the past five years. From account manager type roles in the services world uh, to my current position, which is uh, selling CRM and kind of a sell strategy overlay role. So um, again, thanks for having me on. Look forward to uh, having this discussion. That's great. And, and we're glad to have you on the show. Uh, you've had kind of a meteoric rise uh, at Microsoft and kind of through the tech sales world. So I've, uh, I've always bragged on you a little bit, but we're, we're glad to have you on. Why don't you tell us a little bit about why you got into technology sales? What what interests you about this kind of environment and this workplace, and uh, what keeps you in it? Sure, so I well, appreciate that. So um, I think it's it's pretty easy. I, I've always loved technology, software in particular. Um, I like solving problems, working with large teams, and it's it's always fun strategizing and working on presentations so those are just a, a few things i love and enjoy about the the work good deal well look uh thanks for the episode recommendation um i think this is going to be a fun one to talk through uh it's a big topic and and we'll include on the show notes uh, a link to a diagram that kind of lays out each one of these cognitive biases so um don't don't worry about following this along. You'll actually have a uh, a link that we'll include on the website that highlights all these in pretty good detail. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to talk it through several of these. We'll cover you know five or six or seven of these as we go through the episode today, and we'll kind of go round robin style. So Scott, why don't we start with uh, one that you liked? You bet. So the first one is reactive devaluation, and one of the definitions I found for this is devaluing an idea because it originated from an adversary or opponent. So if you break this apart, there's really a couple of components. The first is who, who or what is the adversary or opponent? And then the second part of it is there's an idea or product that they bring to the table. And uh, let me just share a couple of examples here. And, and the first example is our competitors are winning because their products are cheap or you know, our, our competitor always discounts the product at the end of the sell cycle and thus they always win. The, the, the second example would be something more that you might hear someone on your team say. So it's, it's maybe, you know, Johnny's sales rep always hits his number because he's got a better territory or he's got the best leads coming in or he gets assigned the best resources to help his technical team. So I think in both of these scenarios, you're minimizing efforts or ideas of others. And, and I think anytime you start devaluing someone's success, it's, it's unhealthy behavior. And, and I, 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 the last thing I would add to this is that people generally don't like to hear comments like this. It, it can come off as tacky or petty. And I, I think it's just behavior that you want to try to avoid. So that is reactive devaluation. Yeah, I'd like to add a couple of points to that one as well. I mean, in my world, um, selling big hardware today and both commercial and enterprise over the last two or three years, you know, there's a lot of comp- competition, but that competition in our world is often referred to as ankle biters, uh, where they're new up and comers. I'm sure you both have ankle biters in your worlds as well, but, you know, a, a new flash player, uh, the, 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 bias to them is they're new and sexy so they're getting a lot of attention um and i try to combat this when i hear it in the hallways because you know they're they're out selling us in some instances uh in some instances we're letting them uh to to get to the to the customer first where we shouldn't so I, I hear it all the time there's some new backup players in the world where you know everybody internally wants to talk about how they can't believe a company would bet their business on these custom these companies these competitors but the fact of the matter is they probably don't really understand the solutions and haven't done their due diligence. They probably are good solutions, probably good enough in some cases and maybe even better than some others. So one that I can definitely relate to for sure. It, it's such a, like, Scott, you gave two examples. One was like devaluing your competitor is the first scenario. The second one was devaluing say, a peer or somebody that you work with. It's such a loser mentality to say that person is successful because of X, Y, or Z. Leave that. Leave the petty stuff for other people. There's there's no need to to jump on that bandwagon or be, especially if you're trying to elevate your persona or your career internally. If you're known as the guy that's bagging on successful people, what possibly, what what could you uh, positively gain from that? Possibly, like there there is no positive outcome on bagging for someone. Instead, talk about the positives that they've been able to achieve. They're, they're clearly they've had to overcome some sort of adversity that you know nothing about. There is just no benefit for you uh, to bag on them. And then from a from a competitive standpoint, Bobby, you talked about well that you know the the reactive devaluation could be oh they're the new sexy player in the marketplace. There's nothing to it. They're all they're all sizzle, uh, no substance at all. Or these guys just drop their price down to nothing. It what you're doing when you do that, you're oversimplifying the competitive threat. And by doing that, you're putting your entire evaluation team in a poor position because you're now saying the only reason the customer would buy that product is because of price or it's because of the sizzle. But there are actually 20 other reasons they could buy that product. And 19 of those could be great reasons. And if you're not the one showing leadership in the meeting, to talk about what some of those positive reasons they could buy something for, you're going to lose that deal and it's going to be on your shoulders. Well, one last point to that one. If, if you think about that, any one of those 19 things was something that you could combat because you have a differentiator or you're better and you ignore that, that's, that's solely the reason why you're going to lose. It has nothing to do with all that other stuff. It's you, you, you gave it away, but because you didn't want to do a little bit of work. Yep. Totally agree. So I like that one. 
It's all about reactive devaluation. Why don't we jump into the next one here? It's uh, hyperbolic discounting. And this is preferring, the de- kind of the definition around this one is preferring a smaller, sooner payoff over a larger, later return. And, and kind of the phrase that I coined for this one is, let's just get the deal done ASAP. This is, um, we all live in this world of, and I, actually I saw some news uh, a couple weeks ago about the discussion at least about not having all, not requiring publicly traded companies to, to report on a quarterly basis and instead kind of making this a twice annual basis for, for publicly traded companies in the U.S. I say that to say what, what's kind of driven a lot of this behavior is that most companies that we work for, most tech companies, are driven on a quarterly results basis. And we have management, leadership, sometimes it's us based off of a, a spiff or some sort of commission incentive to get a deal done by the end of the quarter. And it's all at the expense of getting a larger deal done in the future. Um, it's, it's really, if you look at it, the, the math behind this is evaluation of the cost to sell. If you, let's say you can get a deal off the table this quarter, rather than continuing to invest sales pursuit, invest your own time, your own thought process in this deal, um, even if you just get slightly more the next quarter, you've effectively cost yourself because you're not taking into account the full cost of sale for a deal. Um, so this is a it's it's a it's a big thing to be thinking through. You should be really thinking through: Are you is a quarter in the right type of decision, the right thing to be thinking through for an impending deal? Um, and think about too. And this is more of a selfish approach, but I'd like to get, to get your thoughts on this too. When you let's say that you've got a deal done, um, let you, we all have annual targets and we have quarterly targets, probably right. When it comes to the end of the year, does anyone ever remember when you signed that deal? As long as you got to your number, does anyone remember if that deal was done in Q1, Q2, Q3, or Q4? Of course not. Maybe, maybe if it was some accelerators in the Q4 world or something, but I would say probably not. It's it's generally what have you done for me lately? Indeed. And, and the fact is, getting the deal off the table is all great. It's all important. We're all trying to manage the cost to sell. We're trying to be good corporate stewards here. But you, you need to view this a little bit selfish. And if, it, if, it's, if you are cashing in a deal early uh, because it's, you're getting pressure on you, uh, you got to be careful about it because you don't want to miss an opportunity to capitalize on some revenue. Well, and Cherie highlighted it in her interview that we've trained our customers, so they already know that we're susceptible to doing something like this. And the only way we're going to break that and train them differently is to do it a little bit differently. So we we got to think longer game here and not the short game for sure. I had a recent exposure to where a deal that I've been working for years got blown up because of an end-of-quarter offer that we'll never be able to turn around and get it back to where it was before. I was just going to mention, sometimes I see this too, when, when an organization sells multiple products and you, you try to cram in one product instead of uh, having a more grouped approach to the opportunity. Yeah, that's a good example. So let's say that you, you've, not for, you've not gone all the way down the sales cycle for uh, a group of products or one individual product. It's the, the timelines aren't congruent, basically. You're trying to get a deal done. You got another team trying to get a deal done. Everyone just says, why don't we just package it all up together? But you haven't really finished your sales cycle. So the customer is going to, they're going to push back on price. They're going to push back on timeline and that can certainly cost you money. Bobby, why don't you take us through the next one? Yep. Let's gonna, I'm going to do status quo bias. I think we, we probably can all relate to this, but sticking with the competitive conversation that we've been having, right? Uh, I think the definition of the, of the bias is preferring the current state of affairs over change. And I think, you know, at, at Dell EMC, one of our biggest, and I would say every hardware vendor's biggest kind of campaign every year, Microsoft similarly, as it relates to renewals and true ups. And, but at Dell and in, in EMC, it's it's tech refresh, right? When When is the customer yep. going to flip their hardware, right? And if, if obviously that hardware's been good for them for all these years, though, there's there's no way they would look at another technology. Um, and we, we, we're way overconfident that everybody just wants to buy more of the same and stick with the company they're with. And, and we don't take the heed from customers and the market and everything else to say, man, there's probably a real good reason why they are talking to 30 other competitors to try and change it, find a better price, something that may be easier to use or sexier as the last one we discussed. But um, it's one that I think 
we as tech sellers can can get stuck believing that because we are the incumbent we're, we have a, a big shoe a big flag forward and i would often think uh in my campaigns that if i knew there was an incumbent i'm gonna kick their ass just because i know everything about them i know exactly what i'm up against and i don't think we see it that same way when we are the incumbent it, this is very similar in a lot of ways to the uh, hyperbolic discounting in a way, you know, or sorry, reactive de- devaluation. Um, and I think we, we, we just did a series on the challenger cell. And this lines up a lot to um, somebody that's more of a relationship person as opposed to uh, the challenger cell persona. The person that just solely depends on relationships is their, their biggest weakness is that they're not staying current, they're not staying up to date in the industry, um, they're not continuing to bring new and innovative ideas to their customer base. If you're not doing that, you're, you continue to leave a door open to the competition. So if you're an account executive that covers a set group of accounts, uh, so whether it's small or large group of accounts, you, you've got to be bringing new ideas. You've got to be helping to solve new problems, otherwise you're leaving that door wide open. Okay, let's hit the next one. Uh, Scott, so why don't you pick the next one for us? You bet. So uh, anchoring effect is the uh, next one here. And a a good way to define this is relying too much on an initial piece of information offered whenever you're making decisions. So, you know, another way you could say this is you're coming to a conclusion too fast on partial information. And unfortunately, this is something I've been guilty of. And I think my intentions were probably good but it's certainly a shortcut that I've taken here. So um, the example I'll give is that, you know, I'm in a customer discovery session and I'm, I'm listening to the customer tell me something and I hear one business challenge. Let's just say in my world, in, the, in a CRM situation, it might be something about how marketing transitions leads to sales, okay? And so there, there's a poor process there and I've, I've identified one business challenge and so, in my head, I start creating this narrative. I start, you know, I've got this. I understand. I understand why they're looking to buy software. When in reality, it's really just one person who said that. It's it's one idea. For some reason, it clicked in my head, but it may not be important to the group. And what you risk is creating a lot of unneeded momentum, or or wasting cycles on proving that out. And, you know, it, it just could be a bad shortcut to act on. So um, I, I guess the advice that I would say is to be patient and, and try to listen to the whole story before clicking on one challenge and, and going through that whole storyline in your head. Does that make sense? Have you guys experienced this? Yeah, I'm, I've been super guilty of this. In fact, I've, I've had it to the point where the prospect has said to me, okay, forget that part. <laughs> there's, there's more to this story here, right? Like, they're, like yeah, you, we, we got it. You caught on to that one piece of, uh, of feedback here, but there's a much broader picture. Um, and I think the way, I, a piece of advice I'd have to help get away from this is, it, let's say you're running a pursuit team, you're in charge of the evaluation here. Um, when you sit down with your evaluation team, um, try to come up with three or four or five win themes. Don't make it so, um, don't make it so one dimensional. And that, that's going to force you when you're in that discovery session, when you know you have to come up with three to five different win themes, it's going to force you to, to really listen to the entire discovery uh, so that you come up with something really valuable rather than something that's just very binary. I don't want to deviate too far from tech sales, but there's a, a very real issue in the world of aviation, general aviation, where, uh, students and instrument students specifically get something called fixation, which is very similar to this, where they get stuck on one of the many instruments that they should be looking at and actually get hurt really bad because they don't pay attention to the whole big picture. Isn't that a really good analogy? Hopefully no one gets hurt in a plane, but it's a really good analogy to how we lose deals because we get this bias and we get so fixated on that one thing. And Maybe maybe our competition addresses it, but quickly, and then all the other things, right? So it's definitely a slippery slope where you 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 find something like this that you lock into, and you can't get away from it, and you you really miss the bigger picture, and you you forget to look at all those other instruments we might call it. Indeed, it's a good one. All right, I'll take the next one. That is the ostrich effect. 
Uh, this is it. this is an interesting one. So this is avoiding negative, and this could be financial or any sort of information by pretending it doesn't exist. Um, and man, I, I think the way this this exists or comes about in your day to day life may be, hey, um, man, it was it was good to get everyone together, but it looks like we've run out of time to cover X, Y, or Z here. Um, and you're and you're you're leaving the elephant in the room undiscussed. And when maybe that should have been the very first thing that you talked about, um, I've, I've got a couple of tactics to 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 get ahead of this, to be, prepare for this. One is we talked about earlier in the year the five non-negotiable meetings, and that's the strategy meeting, the first dry run meeting. The the first dry run meeting is really all about what things should we be talking about, like what should the actual meeting be about. Dry run meeting number two is all about actually executing and, and going step by step by step how we're going to deliver on that meeting. Then you actually have the customer meeting and then you have a debrief. When you're very intentional about how you structure your sales process and your customer engagement process, it 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 forces you to discuss items like this. But if you're the kind of account executive that says, "Oh, I got a cu- I got a customer meeting with so and so next Thursday," shouldn't we should we catch up like uh, Wednesday? How about I got it? I got a better idea. Why don't we meet for coffee? There's a coffee shop right next to their be- meet- building. Meetings at what ten o'clock? Why don't we meet up there at eight thirty? That way we can kind of prepare for the customer meeting ahead of time. It's being very intentional about how and west how and where you invest your time. Uh, you can really look to avoid this. Um. Yeah, to me, it really, and then the second thing is really it lacks solid execution leads to, to losses here. If you're, if you're um, ducking critical feedback, critical conversations that need to happen, which is a great book, by the way, um, then you're going to lose deals. Um, why not prevent this by being very strategic about where and how you invest your time when you book your meetings and how you get your, your uh, team prepared for this? You know, one one thing I'd add to that is uh, I hear this happen in meetings when someone says, uh, "Let's let's add that to the parking lot," and and it's really what they're trying to say, or sometimes what they're trying to say is, "Yeah, that's that's a piece of information I'm not ready to digest here or talk about. Let's put it on this other list, and hopefully we forget about it by the end of the meeting." Yeah, yeah, and one that I'll add just. Is, is really the money conversation. Um, it's, it's, it's from the Challenger series that we just did. You have to be able to talk about money, and that's probably a, a negative or most often seen as a negative conversation. But you can't avoid the fact that these solutions are going to cost potentially millions and millions of dollars. And if the customer is not ready to have that uh, as part of the dialogue, you're, you're way behind in the sales cycle, the sales methodology, your sales process, everything. You've got to bring it up. And uh, it's, it's the fear that I see reps sitting in their chair not wanting to hear the word no. And if we can get over that, you'll be surprised how much more real your campaigns become. But I want a customer to say, no, I don't have a million dollars for your solution. Because then I understand really what would they be willing to buy. And I probably have a more cost-effective solution, but we're going to have to give up on some of the features and benefits. And I'm sure we can all relate and all have similar talk tracks. Where if it's not if they if they don't want the creme de la creme, we probably have a way to turn some things off and make it a little bit more cost effective. Yeah, and how many times have you chased a a pursuit early in your career, and meeting after meeting after meeting and internal investment and in, in status updates with the management team on a deal that is never going to happen because you never talked about the money early on, uh, or 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 special terms or. It, it could be about money. It could be about contract terms. It could be about what the product includes. It's it's ducking conversations that that waste your time. Good reps, good reps don't mess this up. Good reps nail this. All right, Bobby, why don't you take us through our next one? All right, we're going to do clustering illusion. So it's erroneously overestimating the importance of small clusters or patterns in large data. That's the official definition. I think the way I relate this to tech selling is we'll hear a talk track from someone else uh, regarding uh, a way to beat the competition. And and the example that I use is in the data center world for me today um, and probably cloud conversations that both of you guys have, it's the talk track of how much does that floor space cost in a data center, right? And just recently, 
I heard a, a gentleman on my team going on and on about that we were going to compare the number of whips we were going to be able to reduce uh, from a data center perspective from the power that they would need to run this newer, smaller footprint of data center. And I, he was so, he got really passionate about it on the phone call. And I'm like, you really think this is the, the one thing we want to bet on this, this meeting that we're going to go have with this customer that they can reduce these whips. These whips cost hundreds of dollars and we're asking for millions of dollars. Like it's just such a small piece of a bigger picture that you, you can't sell, you can't sell against that uh, as a reason to consider spending all this money. Um, and I think we get caught up in that a lot where we, we talk about something that whether it seems important to us or it's just a small piece because we know our stuff so well that it erroneously overestimates the value to someone else, which would be the customer or the prospect. And finally, to this point, I'll say it, it interacts with vendors and partners quite a bit too, where we get a little bit biased, obviously, on what we're trying to accomplish, what we need, and we forget what the partner might need in a lot of circumstances. And we overestimate how important our pieces are compared to what the partner's pieces are. And they really change the way that, that we interact with each other. So um, don't get trapped in this illusion. Stay away from those small clusters and large pieces of data. They're not going to swing your sales campaigns like you think they are. Hey, Bobby, what I'd add to that, too, is that when, when this is a great opportunity. Presumably in this deal, you've got a great sponsor that can help you work through this. So if you're brainstorming with your team on the value you think you can uh, add to their business and you have this kind of off-the-wall idea, it's great to collect these things and to really run them by your, your sponsor in the deal. That's really where the rubber meets the road. If you can't get it past him or her that actually loves your product, how are they ever going to get that stuff across to the board and a positive check mark from the board team too? So uh, be thoughtful about it and bring it up to your sponsor. Scott, let's uh, hit another one with you. Okay, the uh, next one is going to be courtesy bias. And uh, a definition I found here is giving an opinion or conclusion that is viewed as more socially acceptable so as to avoid causing offense or controversy. So, um, you know, a, a, a good way to put this is avoiding something difficult because you fear the group may not agree, agree with what, what you're about to say. And, you know, um, we all, all of us likely are, uh, in, in meetings with large amounts of people or we're running sales pursuits with large groups of people. And sometimes there is something that needs to be said and it's avoided. So the example I'd use here is, um, you know, when it comes time, you're preparing for a customer meeting and it's time to do a, a dry run for a software demonstration. And uh, if, if you go about this and say, okay, guys, I'm sure we don't need to prepare for the demo or, hey, let's just, let's just do our dry run in 30 minutes. What you're really telling the team is that this is important. This is not important. No need to spend time here. And um, when in fact, you should feel free to step up and say, you know what, guys, we need three two-hour dry runs. Oh, and then by the way, we also want to do a dry run with our our uh, our stakeholder with the customer just to make sure that we're doing the right thing. And I think people will actually respect you more for being genuine about doing the tough work rather than saying, oh yeah, no, no need for this, this, this long type of meeting. Any, any thoughts on this guys? Yeah, I think uh, it would be so easy. Everyone could very easily dismiss it if you said, uh, yeah, we, yeah, this is an easy one. This is a layup. We've seen this kind of deal a hundred times. There's no need to get super prepared for it. What will eventually start to erode is your extended team's confidence in your ability to run an evaluation team. Because if you if you show up that way, you're you're going to lose. And if you win, you got lucky, and and you're not that that that's not a pattern that can continue to be successful for you. Which means your extended team, if you continue to have loss after loss because of under under preparation. Uh, you're going to have a team that's going to not invest everything in you. They're going to not look forward to get assigned to your team because they know you don't take a winner approach. All right, let's hit the last and final one, and this is stereotyping. Uh, so this is this is a, a fairly obvious one in terms of cognitive biases. We're, we're all familiar with stereotyping, but this is assuming a, a, a person has characteristics because they're a member of a group. So the example I've got is... 
Uh, Dave from technology, the technology team is worried, but frankly, the technology team, they're always pe- pessimists anyway. I, I think the, the stereotype from a traditional account executive is that when it comes to working with a company in a certain industry, working with a company with a certain business problem, there's no one better than the account executive to help put together the plan. When the truth is, a solution consultant or whatever you call them in your business that's doing the actual demonstration that's hand-on keyboards, they've probably done a thousand demonstrations ahead of this one. This is not their first rodeo. They may have, you know, the, the previous employer, they could have been assigned to a industry that very much aligns to where this customer is from. Uh, you know, they have functional credibility, but they could also bring an interesting uh, industry approach as well. Uh, so the, the feedback here is take a step back when you're in these plannings, and it, you can only do this if you have kind of prop, those kind of five critical meetings and you're having the dry runs, is take a step back and don't just assume you, you as the account manager have all the answers. Talk to your enterprise architects or your, or your technology team. Talk to your functional consultants. Get a really good uh, broad view from your extended team before you go approach that customer. The, the truth is there's probably some good intelligence there that it could add to the conversation. I'll add to this one a little bit where I think in this world, we remember people from years ago. Um, if, if, I, if I used Scott as an example, I, I, I could stereotype him in the work that I know he did the last time we worked together. And I see my my co-workers and my peers in in the houston market it's such a small world they relate and they maybe don't just stereotype but they they put them in the shoes that they were in a, a long time ago and have that same perspective but people change jobs they work for different companies they work with different technologies uh, and they might not feel that way anymore the other one that i think is similar to yours but it's finance finance is always cheap i don't dis i don't disagree that they have a mindset of being frugal and taking care of the company but they're not always cheap. They're spending millions of dollars. Uh, they just want to make sure that they're getting the return from the investments they're making. So uh, don't assume you have to discount early all those things because you're talking to a group of people that manage the purse strings because they also spend millions of dollars too. That's great. All right. So with that, we're going to wrap up the episode. Uh, we want to thank everyone for listening. Scott, thanks for, uh, thanks for joining your first episode with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks, guys, for having me on. All right, so with that, I'm going to wrap it up. Uh, as I mentioned before, on our show notes, we're going to have a, a link to this diagram. So if you if you uh, want to investigate it further, we'd love your feedback on it. So, uh, check it out. And thanks, everyone, for listening. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for listening to The Tech Sales Show with Bobby and Brian. Subscribe to their email list by going to bobbyandbrian.com and follow them on Twitter at Sales.